What's up, heathen? How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, we have another installment with Josh uh, here, Josh Noriega from Christian Sophistry. Uh, you guys really seemed to like him last time, and uh, so he's back this week. Except this week, uh, it's a little bit shorter because we're pretty much just covering genetic degradation, what that looks like and, and really what it means. And um, I didn't really give a lot of good information on this. Um, I was mainly focusing on trying to understand his point of view on it, trying to rationalize it. So what I wanted to do is after this uh, interview, I am going to be giving more information. So stick around for that if you want to find out more, or you can go down to the link that I have posted down below in the description, and you can go ahead and read some more good information on it. I'll see you guys after the show. Um, and then moving on to what you had uh, asked about genetic degradation, uh, genetic entropy, rather. Um, like, how can we tell that genetics is degrading? I'd say that the evidence on both sides of the debate say that it is is degrading. Um, that uh, okay. So the the dude that coined the term genetic entropy. Uh, young earth creationist, he's a scientist, but he cites people from both sides of the debate. Um, I'm, well, both sides of, of different worldviews, I should say. He, he cites secular sources that do say that uh, genetics in the human genome are degrading, um, that over generations, we're, our, our, our genetic code is wearing down. Uh, that's that's scientific fact, but they attribute it to different things. Um, that's why this debate is is even a thing. Um, genetic entropy suggests that you know over the course of human history, our our uh, genetic information is wearing down until like eventually we'll no longer be sustainable and and like you know human life will cease to exist uh, on Earth. In inevitably, because, you know, DNA um, won't provide for us a, a way to, like, you know, live. Uh, that's that's the, the side of, of genetic entropy. But I'd say that the idea that our human genome, the genetic information is degrading, I'd, I'd say that that is scientific fact, that genetic degradation is something that is observable today, um, though it's attributed to different things. Okay, well, I, I'm. Uh, I guess I'm just curious. Like, what does genetic degradation look like? Uh, I guess in a population, would that mean that more children are born with like genetic diseases that won't allow them to live, or uh, like like what 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 would genetic degradation look like in reality? I guess. The way that I understand it, um, it's an increase of, yeah, genetic diseases, um, different uh, genetic imperfections at the risk of, of you know, sounding in, uh, politically incorrect. Uh, autism, for example, um, there would be an increase in, in that. Um, the, there would be an increase in uh uh, like different uh, immune systems that are weaker. Um, I don't know, just, uh, I guess, imagine different things that, that would uh, characterize it, a less healthy lifestyle is, uh, I guess, how I would say we could observe genetic entropy in, in the real world. Um, yeah, because it, it is, you know, slow changes over time. Uh, some have postulated 3% degradation over each generation. Some have postulated up to like 5% degradation over, um, and those are just numbers. I have no idea what those mean. But uh, the point is that like, I, I guess the way that we would see it would be a, a recognition of um, genetic diseases or, or maybe an increase in allergies or I don't know, different physical things like that that we might be able to see. Okay, um, but I mean, this would have to be like an exponential increase. 
uh, or or at least an increase that vastly outpaces how fast we're growing as a, a planet, as far as the population goes. Because I mean, of course, if you have more people, then you're gonna have more like cases of autism or cases of allergies. Um, so I mean, it would it would have to vastly outpace it, and I mean, we just don't see that like happening at all why why would it have to vastly outpace uh is it like generations that you, like you're, you're saying that it would happen so fast that it would like kill us off faster than it is right well no no no, no. i'm saying that changes mm -hmm. over time pile up and eventually uh you know over over time you would see like a drastic increase in in like non viable offspring, mm -hmm. uh, you would see a drastic uh, decrease in maybe lifespan. You would see a drastic decrease in all of these other things if the genetic code was actually, you know, degrading as as fast. You know, mm -hmm. it, I'm just saying that that you would eventually see. Like the 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 number of uh you know across the board go up if we were actually degrading, uh, uh genetically, and I mean I'm still confused over the whole genetic uh degradation idea because okay. I mean uh every you know whenever whenever you reproduce or or even as you go throughout your life you know you replace your cells cells divide. And, you know, oftentimes, like, that's how cancer is formed. Um, you know, you get a mutation in, like, a skin cell because a UV light causes the mutation and you end up getting cancer. Um, so, like, that wouldn't be, like, a genetic uh, thing that, you know, happened, like, at birth. That would be something that happened later. Right. So uh, I, I get. I guess I'm just not. Uh, I'm not understanding like what <clears throat> what the genetic degradation, you know, actually is in in reality. Like I I, w I don't know how to characterize the genes as being degraded. You know. Right. Um, well, I, I guess I wouldn't identify cancer as a a. a, a you know, side effect of genetic degradation, but the mechanism that you just identified cells dividing and, and mutations happening every time that, you know, cells divide, that's, that's the mechanism for genetic degradation to occur. Um, the analysis is that each time your cells divide, uh, they produce more harmful genes than they do produce good genes or, or genes that, you know, would create stronger immune systems or absence of allergies or, uh, you know, things like that. Um, and I, I haven't seen the numbers on it, but I, I wouldn't say that we can't see, um, in, an increase in, uh, genetic imperfections. I've, I, I've seen more people with allergies in this generation as opposed to the last generation. Um, I think uh, people, you know, my age and people younger than me get sick more often than uh, people of, of previous generations. Um, we kind of rely on modern medicine nowadays. So it's uh, our, our lifespans would be severely lesser if it were not for that. And, and that wasn't, you know, necessarily the case in uh, ancient histories. Where, um, where, where modern medicine was absent, and I, I would believe that they had uh, stronger immune systems because they didn't have to rely on, on you know, antibiotics and stuff that we put in our bodies. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I guess, I guess, does this genetic entropy only apply to uh, you know humans, or does it apply across the board? Because uh, I mean, I think the the biggest the biggest thing that you know animals have to over uh, to conquer is pretty much humans. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't I don't think that there's a, a population on on the earth that are dwindling naturally. Mm -hmm. 
like for instance, know, you know, silverback gorillas i mean they they were nearly hunted to extinction um, right, right the uh rhinoceroses um in uh wait was it yeah rhinoceroses in africa are are evolving horns uh, mm-hmm. out mm-hmm. of their species because mm-hmm. of of hunters um mm-hmm. so I, I guess I'm I'm still I'm still a little confused on the whole genetic entropy thing, like what what that would actually look like. I, I know that you don't have all the answers or whatnot, so I'm not going to harp on that uh, right, at, right. much longer. Um, but uh, I guess um, I, I just don't see like uh, I I could, I could see like three percent changes, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. to the to the genetic code or whatnot over a generation, but I don't necessarily except that they're bad changes um, or that there's more bad changes than good changes. Like, I think there's, it's, it's hard to really gauge that, but I mean, then again, I'm in the same boat as you are. I'm not an expert in the genetic field. So um, yeah, I'm going to need to read up on that. If there's anybody watching that knows a lot more about it than either of us, please go down below and, and uh, let us know. Um, and I know both of us like conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, guys, I hope you love that particular part of the conversation. We will be continuing next week in the conversation with Josh. But I wanted to give some more information about genetic degradation or uh, ge- genetic deficiency or whatnot uh, as we evolve. So during my talk, one of the prominent things was uh, this idea of harmful genetic mutations and how they may degrade the sub, uh, subsequent genetic viability uh, while uh, procreating. Now, while there are experiments with E. coli that show that there are actually fewer beneficial uh, mutations than harmful ones, but most mutations that happen are neutral. And as I specified in, in the, the interview here, these harmful mutations don't survive in the evolution of a species. Generally, the mutations that are beneficial to a creature will survive versus the harmful ones. Uh, obviously, if you think about it logically, they would survive, uh, y- you know, um, more so than the harmful ones. Because the harmful ones are just going to cause that lineage of organisms to die off quicker. While the uh, organisms that have the more beneficial traits that, that highlight those are going to survive in the environment. Now, if you consider the amount of surviving mutations versus harmful mutations, actually all of the mutations that eventually exist or are solidified in the DNA are beneficial mutations. Now, these beneficial mutations can actually be observed in everyday life. From antibiotic-resistant bacteria to humans that are resistant to the AIDS virus. Mutations have given bacteria the ability to degrade nylon. Plant breeders have used these mutations and these methods in order to make plants stronger. To be, you know, more productive in their vegetation. And if you if you want to highlight some Hollywood examples of this, Unbreakable is an actual real world example of how these mutations can benefit humans. Now, I know, I know it's a little bit of a magical movie, considering that he pretty much touches somebody and he sees whatever bad shit they've done. Kind of like a real live um, sort of God almost being able to touch somebody. Um, but that's not the case that I'm talking about here. The case in Unbreakable is the spectacle of humans that lie in the real world as far as bone density. There are humans that have very brittle bones that essentially break so easy that it's dangerous for them to just walk around versus the uh, humans that have very dense bones, not just because they drink a lot of milk, but because they have these mutations that cause denser bones. The environment is, <laughs> it should obviously be taken into account when considering a certain mutation beneficial or harmful. A mutation that doesn't benefit an organism in one environment could potentially be beneficial in another environment. So just uh, the, the mutation alone doesn't make it harmful. You also have to consider the environment. And as we all know, environments change. Right now, our world is going through massive changes through climate change. 
And so as these environments change, one mutation that was harmful could turn into a beneficial mutation. But again, all of this just highlights the role that these mutations play in evolution and how it doesn't actually degrade any kind of genetic viability in uh, organisms, but rather strengthens the organism to survive in the environment that it's in. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, go down below, leave me a like. Also, leave me a comment about what you thought about this particular section of the series. Don't forget to check out the other parts of uh, this interview with Josh, and I will see you heathens later. Bye, guys.